Welcome, welcome, everybody. Uh, today, we have our first webinar of 2023, Problem Solving with Story Thinking. I'm Molly Heffernan, Director of Marketing for the Tory Burch Foundation, and I am thrilled, beyond thrilled, to welcome Sarah Lagateria, who is a 2019 Tory Burch Fellow, a longtime uh, supporter of everything the foundation has done, uh, the founder and head educator of Just Bloom School, which specializes in creativity training to build resilience, self-efficacy, and innovation for businesses. So, I mean, it doesn't get better than that. And Sarah, as always, it is great to see you again. You have been somebody that I have looked up to since we met, um, just in such admiration of the work that you do with your business and the way that you approach uh, every everything you do. Um, so I know our community is going to learn so much today. Um, and everybody, you know, Sarah is here with us to really talk about nurturing creativity mm -hmm. and using it to meet your company's biggest challenges. Um, and something that she's familiar with, she's a small business owner, she has, you know, been in the trenches. She is an entrepreneur. So she, she gets what everybody here is going through. And so, um, you know, today's going to be a great session. After Sarah presents, we will have plenty of time for Q&A. So please use the Q&A box uh, to ask your questions. We don't want them to get lost in the chat. As you can <laughs> see, the chat is moving fast. We have everybody from all over the country chiming in the chat. So Q&A box, so we can see all the questions come through. Um, and we are going to do our best to answer as many as possible. Today's session will be recorded, so fear not. If you miss something, you can go back, you can check it out, um, and really just take the time to be present and soak up everything Sarah has to say today. Um, so I guess with that, I'm going to pass it to you, Sarah, and I'm going to go off camera so I'm not a distraction. <laughs> well, thank you, Molly. That is the most nice, wonderful introduction I could ever expect. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here with all of you, seeing your names pop up in the chat box. Um, so honored to be asked to start the year with you um, and be a part, a continuing part of this Tory Birch Foundation and everything, all the wonderful things they do for all of us. Um, and just thank you, Molly, who I adore and I'm so excited to get to work with today. So again, as Molly said, my name is Sarah Lagarteria and I am the head educator of Just Bloom School, which is located in Columbus, Ohio. And what we do at Just Bloom School is we are pioneering the first new theory of creativity since World War II. And I'll talk quite a bit about that and how it's different. And it's a narrative theory of creativity. And it's a theory of creativity that my husband, Angus, actually came up with and in his laboratory here at OSU. And we work on this together. So we are partners in this business. And it's, as I said, a narrative theory of creativity. And I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen with you all now. And our method is what we call story thinking, as Molly said. And it's story thinking to differentiate from storytelling, because the importance of our method isn't so much that you're telling somebody a story that you've thought of, it's that you're actually thinking the story in your mind. And we'll talk a lot about triggering your deep brain, which is where your creativity comes from and how thinking in story is what actually does that. So the title of the webinar today is Solving Problems with Story Thinking. And my hope is that by sharing with you what we do in our research and also a few exercises um, and having you actually start those exercises here on the webinar is that I can help you develop a creativity practice that will boost innovation and optimism in your business and also just help you begin to meet your company's most complex challenges. So we are gonna get to it. And I wanna start out just by talking briefly about bravery. Sorry about that. Um, if you're on this webinar, chances are you are a founder or a business person, an entrepreneur, or someone who's just considering going into that area. And if you are one of these people, you are brave. So I hope you can just start 2023 just thinking, I am somebody who is brave. Because if you've had a vision or you've looked at the world and thought, I see something that needs some tweaking and I know how I can affect that, and then you've made that vision a reality, you are a very brave person. So I just wanna run through this list here. These are ways that we define bravery, particularly in the business world. So being brave means that you are an individual. 
Being brave means that you are not afraid to fail in public. It means that you remain optimistic even when you're struggling and particularly when you're facing a defeat, right? Or a failure. It means that you're someone who's always game to challenge the pack. It means that you're willing to change your mind even publicly when new information comes up. It means that you're willing to embrace uncertainty and that you even trust that uncertainty is where so much creative potential and opportunity comes from. And it means that you're willing to risk what no one else has ever risked before. So I'm hoping in going through this list, you're starting to see a little bit of yourself here. Now the problem or the challenge that I think a lot of us, myself included, have dealt with when you've made your brave vision a reality is that suddenly you can get bogged down in the day-to-day -day of your business. So, and I know we talk about this a lot in the foundation workshops is this challenge of working on your business as opposed to working in your business. But when there are a million emails to respond to, when there's payroll, when there are issues with employees, sometimes what brought you to this position, that moment of courage and that moment of vision really gets sidelined as you start to deal with these day-to-day -day, um, concerns and logistics. Oops, excuse me. So our question is how do we become more brave and how do we keep that bravery sort of at the forefront of our daily actions? And the answer is quite simply, we practice creativity, okay? And what is creativity? Creativity is the ability to solve open-ended complex problems. Now, the number one thing that I get told by people in our workshops is, well, I'm not creative. This isn't for me. I'm not a creative person. Well, the truth is that the primary source of creativity is simply the desire to be creative. So if you want to be creative, you just need to practice it and you will be. It's the same as any of these other well-being um, activities that you pursue. So if you're somebody who has a yoga practice, this is no different than that. It's something you want to keep practicing and you'll get better and better and better at. Another question is, where in the world does creativity come from? And that's something I'm gonna focus on quite a bit today because creativity actually comes from mostly our deep brain. And from the neuroscience perspective, it's 95% of our creativity comes from our deep brain, specifically the motor cortex. So why is that important? That's important because our method focuses on deep brain activity. Current training in creativity is largely based on divergent thinking. Some of you may have heard this term before. So if you've ever taken a creativity class, whether it's through a business you worked for, or it's a college course, or just something you did online, a lot of these are available online, that focus on things like concepts like ideation or brainstorming, or if you were um, even design thinking, these all fall under the umbrella of divergent thinking. And divergent thinking is the most commonly accepted theory of creativity. It started right after World War II. It's really developed with soldiers who were returning home after the war. But we noticed that there are three challenges with divergent thinking. The first is that divergent thinking focuses chiefly on the memory and logic centers of the brain. And we know from neuroscience that only 5% of our creativity comes from the memory and logic centers of the brain. Second, Divergent thinking is not accessible. So there have been tons of studies done in the past on divergent thinking. And what they show is that people who do divergent thinking exercises, they get better at those exercises. But there's no concrete link between divergent thinking and actual creative output. Third, divergent thinking runs directly counter to how the most creative people in the world think. And my guess is you all know who that population is. We have a population on the planet that is the most creative group of individuals. You might even have them running around your house. It's children under the age of nine. Nine is the point at which kids start to see or start to demonstrate a decline in their creativity. And there's also a decline at that moment in their self-confidence. And that's something that we really noticed. And as parents, of two elementary school children, we were really troubled by that and thought, okay, well, there's got to be a link here that we need to figure out. So the thing is that children don't fuse their memory and logic centers. They're notoriously bad at memory and logic games. What they are good at is thinking in terms of story. So if you've ever watched a five-year-old running around a playroom 
and has a sword and is creating an entire story and you walk through the room and they incorporate you into that story and suddenly you're a dragon, you know that kids are just naturally fantastic at creating stories. So how do we mimic what they do? And how do we trigger the deep brain by doing so? The answer is that we think in terms of things such as character, setting, plot, and narrator. So these are all, I'm sure, familiar to you from junior high English classes. Um, but the, the answer here is that we are thinking in story. Now, how do we take these English class concepts and move them into the real world? Because what we're talking about today is, of course, real world problems. And the answer is that we talk about perspective shifting when we think of character. And instead of talking directly about setting, we're going to talk about world building. So all of you founders out there, this is something you're already really good at. You know how to build a world. You've created a company culture. Um, we don't talk specifically about plot. We talk about making plans. So I always like to say, how many of you woke up this morning and you made a plan for the day? Just automatically you're in bed and you think, all right, I'm going to get up. I'm going to brush my teeth. I'm gonna get the kids off to school. I'm gonna go for a run. Then I have a meeting, then I have a call. You run through that whole day-to-day -day schedule. That already is story thinking. It is natural to you. You're plotting your day forward. And then instead of talking about narrators like we do in an English class, we talk very specifically about who is giving us the capital W, Y of this story. So a lot of times this is the motivation. This is the personal push behind the story that you're telling yourself. You're the person, you're the lens that we're seeing your world through. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about our research and how we know that story thinking works. We conduct our research with two different populations. The first, we work with the US Army. More specifically, we work with special operations and we do this for two reasons, one, it's this enormous organization. So if we are going in and working with businesses, chances are conflicts, challenges, different opportunities that can come up with businesses will have already come up within the whole huge US Army construct. Second, they let us run all of our workshops as independently verified studies. So this is where we get a lot of our data in terms of how story thinking is affecting creativity. So what I've got up here is a little chart that shows the results of our last study that we did with elite military leaders. This was done in last August, and it was a two hour workshop. And it was using many of the same exercises that we're actually gonna to do together today. Um, it was two, like I said, two hours, 260 soldiers. These were pretty high up leaders. And what we saw was after that two hour workshop, all participants showed an average 14% increase ineffective IQ. Now, I'm hoping that you're listening to that and thinking this person is crazy because you can't suddenly sprout IQ. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. So we had to really look at the data and be like, what is going on here? And what we found was that these soldiers were accessing IQ that they already had, but they never knew how to activate. And effective IQ is specific IQ. This is IQ that is used to solve complex open-ended problems. And in this case, solving them under time constraint. So the soldiers who came into that workshop who were testing average in terms of IQ involved with solving problems, they left superior. The ones who came in who were superior, they became gifted. And the ones who came into the study gifted left testing at the genius level. So novelty went up, which is the creativity in their response, but also suitability and feasibility also went up. And I really want to emphasize that with you guys, because this isn't training that helps you come up with like random creative ideas. Creativity in itself isn't random. What happened was the soldiers were getting better at, at devising plans that fit the challenges that they were given by their commanders. So these were answers and solutions that actually worked for their problems. Um, so we really, it's not about, we're not throwing spaghetti at the wall. You will go through these trainings and just get better at finding effective solutions to the problems that you're facing. Now, what about the kids, right? We talked about how 
Creativity declines starting right around age nine. Confidence declines around that exact same time. This was really a strong guiding force in our research because again, having kids that age, but also noticing as you go through all the literature that the longer someone stays in school, the less creative they become. That was shocking to me. So even if you are studying a creative subject, the longer you're in school, as you progress through your education, the less creative you become. And that goes all the way through graduate school. And that holds um, true, even if you're studying something that we think of as traditionally creative. So if you're studying art or you're studying design, even if you're an engineer, you are still losing creativity or losing creative IQ points as you are educated. So totally shocking. So what we did last summer is we ran our first creativity camp and we worked at that intervention point. So it was third, fourth, and fifth graders. And we had them for seven mornings in a row. It was really over two weeks, but seven mornings. And we did the exact same exercises that I'm gonna do with you today, just slightly tweaked to their specific age group and real world problems. And what they did is they came in and they, the researchers asked each one of them individually, what's a problem you're struggling with? And they shared their problem. And then the researchers asked them, can you come up with a solution to that problem? Not one child came up with a solution. Across the board, they were either, they either shut down emotionally, you could even see it. They asked if they could talk to an adult to get some help or they became angry. And we've learned through our research that an anger response is usually the result of not believing that you have the ability to ever solve your own problems. So it was a grim day in the research, in the research pod. So then we went through the training and again, it was seven days of training doing the exact exercises that we're gonna be working with today. And what happened at the end of that training period is the researchers then presented each child with that problem again. So, hey, you came in last week, you told me this was a problem that you were dealing with. Can you come up with a solution to this problem now? Every single kid came back with a solution that was rated on a creativity scale as fairly creative. And then the difficult part, which is they were told by the researchers, thank you for that, but I'm so sorry, your solution does not work. And every single kid took a moment, took a beat to think about it and came back with a response that rated even more highly on the creativity scale. So those were remarkable results, but because what we saw was that not only did the creativity go straight up, but also we saw their emotional and psychological resilience, that they were okay being told, hey, it doesn't work because they trusted in themselves that they could come up with another answer. And that's what creativity training is all about, is helping people have that sense of self-efficacy, the belief that they can solve their own problem, and also that sense of resilience and that sense of optimism moving forward because you can script not just one, but two or three or four or five solutions to whatever problem is coming your way. So why do we practice story thinking? Because our research shows that it boosts creativity, it boosts innovation. So for those of you who are curious, we define innovation as creativity that works. So creativity that is tested and then works. It significantly amplifies emotional and psychological resilience. It boosts optimism and joy. And we see in all of our studies, significant increases in self-efficacy. So that's the belief that we can solve our own problems. And I always think, imagine how amazing the world would look if everyone walking down the street was walking around with a sense of self-efficacy. Um, and it also eases negative feelings and symptoms like anger, irritability, burnout, inattention and restlessness. And I wanna pause here because when I work particularly with women business owners, these are the feelings that they tend to report back to me. I have these feelings, they're kind of vague, it sort of feels like burnout, sort of feels like restlessness. Um, and our, you know, our phone feeds are swamped with cures for those feelings. And we know we know what we should be doing, right? We need a good sleep schedule, we need to eat well, we need to exercise, we need to drink more water, all these things. But I would offer up that as we get into these exercises, that another thing you could consider doing when you feel particularly restless, and the way I'm defining that is 
coming home after a day at work and a day that's gone well, like nothing went wrong. It was a perfectly fine day and just feeling like you can't settle. So that these are the days where you're dying for that glass of wine or you're ready to binge watch your favorite show. A lot of times while you're feeling, the reason why you're feeling that restlessness is because your deep brain where that 95% of creativity comes from needs to be let out for a run. Your brain is telling you something with that restless feeling. And what you can do when that happens is simply do one of the exercises that we're gonna start now just run through it. They're fun. They can be quick and see how it makes you feel. It may be that for some of you, that can actually help out with those feelings. So just something to keep in mind. We are going to move now into our exercises. And I hope all of you have pen and paper because I've set the exercises up so that you can all respond to the first part of each exercise live with us today. So you can actually get those, that answer written down so that then you're primed when the webinar is over to go back and finish them. And, and then we're super lucky today, Al Fleece, who is the um, founder of, I'm gonna get you the whole name right, of Woe Travel, which is Women Powered Adventure and Hiking Trips. It's an incredible business. I recommend you check out the website. She's also a 2020 fellow. And she volunteered today to actually go through the exercises on the webinar with us, share with us her story thinking. And then we'll have a chance as a group to hear examples. And I'll fill in um, with some anecdotes for other workshops I've done wherever we need to have that happen. So our first exercise is a warm up. I call it the shift to narrative. So this is the moment where we are gonna move from thinking logically to thinking narratively. So we're just activating that deep brain. And specifically this exercise asks you to shift perspective. It asks you to world build and it totally builds empathy, often for yourself, and then also for other people as well. So my assignment to everybody, and we'll give you all a minute to do this before we actually start talking to Alice about her responses, is to think of a person who is important to you. And I want you to write down three of what we call to be sentences that describe them. So the examples I've given here today are Katie is kind, Katie is generous, Katie is overwhelmed, they don't need to necessarily be positive things. They just need to be things that you have noticed about that person who is important to you and to have that structure. Katie equals kind. Katie equals generous. Um, if it were me, Sarah is always late. Don't feel like you can't do the negative things. A lot of times we learn a lot about people and ourselves when we pick up on those details. So take a minute and see if you can write that down. Pick a person. My only recommendation is that you don't do your own children if you have them. I find people can't be objective about their kids. So we'll give you a minute. So then once you have your sentences, and these are logical equation sentences, right? Sarah is late. Katie is kind. I want you to move them into narrative mode. So you're going to pick one of these sentences and you're going to substantiate it with specific detail. So think about the person you chose as if they're a character in a novel that you like to read or they're a character in a movie. What is their tell? So what is the action they took when you were reading or watching that told you that this person is, for example, overwhelmed? You're looking for that specific action detail that shows you that that person is what you've described them as. And I want you when you're doing this to focus again on details and actions. Um, and you can do it with all three. So you've, you're primed, you've picked your person, you've written your three to be sentences. So when the webinar is over, you can go back and just run through all three. But I asked Allison, actually, if she would do it just with one person to start. So Allison, we can, can, can you hear us? Can you talk? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being here. Thank you. This is awesome. I'm so excited to hear what your response was and what you came up with. And yeah. um, 
let's just have you share if you don't mind. Are you willing to share your three yeah. sentences? Yep. Should okay. I say who the person do I do you want me to say who the person is? If you feel comfortable, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. So this is my business partner, Danielle. So I'm a co-founder of Woe Travel, stands for Women High on Adventure. Um, and so Danielle is um, creative, Danielle is meticulous, and Danielle is adventurous. Nice. I love those. Okay. And did you pick one of those? I did. I, I picked meticulous. Okay. <laughs> I love and, it. Uh, do you want me to read just what I put down? Absolutely. Yeah. So Danielle puts care, thought, and detail into everything she creates. For example, when she designs and creates physical products like swag for our company, um, she invests time into finding the perfect supplier who creates products ethically and of the highest quality even down to the thread that they use on a beanie. Um, <laughs> so um, sometimes it takes us days to send a newsletter because we're belaboring things back and forth. And that's definitely not led by me. That's led by her. Um, so there's <laughs> great care that goes into all of Danielle's work and she never settles until it's the best. Um, she recently overhauled our entire company website oh because gosh. she thought of new ways to present information that would be a better user experience. Um, she's never content with leaving things the way they are, even though the way they are might work and might be the easier approach. She never settles. She strives to constantly be learning, improving and growing and leading by example. Uh, she challenges others to think differently, to be intentional and to th think through everything they're doing. Okay. I love it. Allison, thank you so much. So all of you listening, can you now, can you see Danielle? I mean, can you see her as a character in this story of Allison's business? Like she's someone, I love like the verbs you use, like she's challenging people. She, I think, I can't remember if you said obsessive, but she just, you know, she'll focus, hyper-focus on things like the thread in a beanie. So suddenly we have these really tangible, tangible examples of this person who is a real full-bodied character, right? It's not simply somebody who is meticulous. We know so much more. And then we can come to that conclusion ourselves. So Allison just like launched us beautifully into thinking narratively. And as we know from what I've showed you before, just by doing that, just having fun with Danielle and actually writing out all those great details, she is triggering her deep brain. She is starting to use all that creative IQ naturally. And that's it. That's the entire warm up. It's just moving yourself into that narrative framework and focusing on those details. And hopefully, um, one of the positive, I think, results of actually doing this warm up exercise. And I will confess, I do this probably two or three times a week in a shower. Like, I can't stop doing this exercise with people because a lot of times what happens is you can pick someone who maybe you're feeling a little frustrated with. So, like, Allison gave this great example where sometimes their newsletter goes out days late, which you can see, like, you know, that's Danielle. But you, by focusing on those details that make Danielle this way, it helps all of us to appreciate the fact that she's meticulous and that that's bringing this amazing thing to the table. So it's not simply that the newsletters go out late and you can feel frustrated by that. It's like, hey, that's a sign of this attribute that this person in my life has that I can now appreciate and also understand her more when I see these things happening. So hopefully it creates a lot of empathy in your relationships. So thank you, Allison, for that. Um, our second exercise is called Born to Innovate. It also helps you shift perspective. So just like how Allison was showing us, we were sort of seeing the world more through Danielle's perspective. Um, also will help you world build and focus in not only on your own personal why, but also on the why of someone that is important for you. So for everybody on the webinar who has a pen and paper, I hope that you will do this first part with us now so that you're ready to finish it later which is simply choosing a person in your family, and it's however you define family, birth or found, somebody who did something new, original, or utterly individual. This is someone who stands out to you as different or unique. And I want you to commemorate their achievement by writing a one-page biography of them. You're gonna work in the exact same manner you worked in with our warm-up exercise. You're gonna focus on their actions and any details that you know. Now. Do you have to get this biography correct? Is it factual? Not at all. You can do this 
about somebody who you have ever never even met in your family. I love to do it about, I have a great aunt and I, she's one of the first people I ever did this exercise with. And I knew her as an old woman. I didn't know her as a young woman, but I'd heard enough stories that I could start to create a narrative around some of her actions. Now, would it pass judgment as a factual biography? Nope, again, it's about the fact that you are using that deep brain narrative part of your mind. It's all about the benefits that are happening in your brain. So go ahead, take a few seconds just to choose that person that you wanna do. And then if Allison's willing, she's gonna share with us what she wrote. Okay. I oh shoot, where did it go? Okay. <laughs> you were making a face, okay. Allison. I hope it's a good one. Yes, yes, so I thought I lost <laughs> it. And I was like, not my bio. Oh no, okay. your bio. So I did my Aunt Cece. Nice. So I'll just go right in. Um, you want me to read the whole thing? It's not that long. I don't, I yeah. think it's a little less than a, okay. okay. Perfect, yeah, so, read it. My aunt Cece is the youngest of three sisters on my mom's side. Cece, also known as Cecilia, stands out to me because she was the first in my family to move away from her home state of Michigan. Cece moved to Alaska in her 50s, leaving behind her friend's family and career and created a new life in a new state far away from everything and everyone she knew. Not only did my aunt Cece move to Alaska, she moved to a remote region of Alaska called Gustavus. Gustavus is only accessible by jet, bush plane, or ferry, and everyday life was harder than anything she experienced in Michigan suburbia. Getting the mail, groceries, running to the store, it all took a lot more effort and planning. After some time in Gustavus, my aunt moved to Sitka, Alaska, where I got the chance to visit her. It was there that I saw my aunt's new lifestyle firsthand and truly admired this newfound life she had created for herself. Mm -hmm. I took note after dinner one evening, sorry. I took note after dinner one evening that she was freezing every last bit of unused food. When food is harder to come by and more expensive, you don't waste a piece. I remember thinking, if only we all did that all the time, how much less food waste there would be. And that's been something I've been an advocate for since that very moment at my aunt's house in Alaska 11 years ago. I remember we went hiking and kayaking together too when we saw sea lions and bald eagles. Doing these activities together was so special. It was like I was with a new person far from the suburban Michigan aunt I knew my whole life. And I loved it. I could see myself in my aunt or perhaps seeing my aunt do something so far outside her normal path awakened something in me because shortly after that trip, I quit my job and started my adventure travel nice. company, which I'm still running today. <laughs> Allison, thank you. That is so beautiful. Does Cece know this? Does she know the role she played? No, but I'm thinking. You gotta Cece tell her. her. I know, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was incredible. So, you know, Allison literally even took it to that next step, which is how does this impact the way you live your life, right? Because we, even when we think of ourselves as creative individuals, we get stuck in our routine. So if something's worked in the past, we just keep doing it, or we even feel this pressure that we have to live our lives a certain way. So being able to point to someone in your family, such as Cece, who made a different choice and who we, for reasons of our own, have singled out, and sometimes these are not conscious reasons. It seems more conscious in Allison's case because her aunt is really an adventurer and it feeds into what that part of Allison as well. But sometimes it's not conscious and we don't know why we pick this person. But there's something in the way that person has lived their life that inspires us to do things differently. And so the goal here with this is to really give yourself almost an entire reference book because you can do this exercise again and again. Do it with someone in your family, do it. Um, you can see how easily it lends itself to doing with maybe with someone in your industry. And again, it doesn't have to be somebody that you know. It could be somebody, you could all do it, you know, which is somebody you admire um, who you've never met. You can do it with a, an historical figure. In the military, we do it a lot with generals of the past. But the idea is you've given yourself another possible way to do things. So what I always recommend is Think of something small. In Allison's case, she literally quit her job and started this incredible new business that she has. But for somebody else, you may be struggling for how to lead your monthly meeting, or you may sometimes just find yourself feeling really uninspired when you're responding to email. And that's a moment to think, well, could I send this email differently? Could, like, what would CC do? And that's really the goal of this exercise is to remind you first and foremost that there is creativity already in your family right? You were born as part of a lineage of creators. And two, you have the ability and the resources to come up with a different future and a different action path for yourself. And Allison literally 
made that happen with her business. So like, that I, couldn't have I been have better. To say, like doing it, I don't even, I never articulated this. I've yes. never done it. And it was because I did this exercise that I was like, oh, I'm connecting the dots now. Like, that oh. makes me so happy. Yeah, that makes <laughs> me so happy. And I think Literally. those are the kind of epiphanies we want you to have. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, sort of just like going back to, oh, go ahead, Allison. What were you saying? Oh, no, it's, I, I, I like, I, I'm just really surprised by it all because I, like, like you asked me if I've ever shared her, shared this yeah. with her. It's like, no, because this is the first time I'm saying it out loud. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm so honored you're doing it with us. That's incredible. Um, and it is like an epiphany, right? And so I want to actually pause on that for a moment because we've all had those epiphany moments, right? Where you're like, in line at the grocery store and you're paying the bill and suddenly you realize, oh, I know what to do. I've had this problem. It's bothered me for a month, but I suddenly know what to do. So epiphany moments are when something that your deep brain has been working on in the background comes to the fore. So it's coming from that center of creativity that we talked about. It's really the motor cortex and sometimes the emotion centers as well. So what's happening with those moments is again, it's just, it's not that it came out of nowhere. It just burst through um, because you're not actively working in that motor cortex. So basically what happened was Allison was really having an epiphany because this is probably something that's been living in your mind for a long time, but she's never actually thought about it. So one of the goals in story thinking is the more active you get with these kinds of exercises, the more that you're going to have those epiphany moments because you're getting better at accessing that deep part of your brain, which is what Allison did. Uh, Allison, it's a beautiful story. I hope you share it with her. <laughs> See, and just the fact that her name is Cece, it's like beaches. It just, you know, she's going to be a great person. Right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're going to move on. It's so, I love that name. Move on to exercise three. So really talking about, or coming off of Alice and talking about how she created this whole new future for herself. Exercise three is all about what possible futures can you create? And this is such a fun exercise for me personally. I was actually doing it this morning. Um, we're going to plot forward. So what I want you all to do in your notebooks is think of one small change that you can make today that would have a big impact on your life. So the example I always use is, what if I never looked at my phone before 9 a.m.? Just stopped, never picked it up until 9 a.m. And then I want you to plot that small change forward. So what would that look like in a week? What's that gonna look like in a month? How about six months? How about three years? And I know that sounds crazy, but if you get down into the granular and the nitty gritty of what your life looks like, if you make that small change, you can get really, really specific and start to see very plausible futures come out. And this isn't a new year's resolution. I'm not saying that you have to pick, I'm going to drink more water every day and that you have to actually do it. Again, it's the process of thinking through the story that wakes up all your creativity. So Allison, do you want to tell us what you chose? Yes. Yes, 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 this one is fun. Okay, so I want to do less takeout and less dining out and cook and bake more. Okay. So, okay, plot that change forward. In one week, um, I'd have to prep for it. It's not going to come naturally. I'd have to get used to thinking through meals for the whole week, grocery shop appropriately, get used to being in the kitchen. And that's not a territory I know very well. Um, and it would save me a little bit of money. One month, I it would I'd definitely be saving a lot more money by now. I'd be eating healthier. I'd be having more, more control over what goes in mine and my family's bodies. Um, I'd feel more comfortable with meal planning after one month of doing this. I'd save time because I don't have to belabor over what to eat every night. Um, and overall, it would be a less stressful situation because with having to think about it every single night, it causes stress. Yeah. Um, and I would be eliminating that. Um, Six months out, I'd have a wide range of things I could bake, cook. I'd feel very comfortable trying new cuisines. Um, I'd have a new skill even, maybe. Um, I will have saved countless hours deciding what to have for dinner and money. Um, you know, it's going to have been thought out ahead of time. So, yeah. So, like, over six months' time, I think I would have saved, like, my brain and money. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Um, and then three years out, I'm a pro chef. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, I will have, again, saved countless hours of time, money, and my family will have eaten better for a substantial amount of time. I'll, um, it, cooking at home will just be a part of our lifestyle. Um, 
I'll feel super confident and comfortable in the kitchen. I can host friends and family for dinners without stress. Um, and when we do dine out or order in, we'll appreciate it more because it's novel and it's not something that we do every day. I love that. I think that's super relatable for a lot of people. It's my guess. Um, and I think you did an amazing job like that. Yeah. You'll have a new skill. You'll suddenly have a new appreciation for food that you used to just take for granted. And then what I would do is if we were working on this in a workshop is I would even push you a little further, Allison, because you said this great thing multiple times, which is that you would have countless hours back that you would have given to stressing about meal planning or trying to figure out what to feed the family at that night. So then my next question for you would be, what are you doing with that time? Let's plot that forward and see what possibilities come out of that. So suddenly you are this in three years, a person who really has changed a lot. And I think there's a whole, you opened up a whole other area that we can also continue to explore. So you guys can see hopefully that this is just really an opportunity to suddenly see what your future could look like. And again, you're not tied to this. This is a brain exercise that you can repeat. You can do multiple changes and you can come up with multiple futures even from the one change. And I know we're um, getting close on time, but I just really quickly want to present you with this bonus exercise because it builds on the plane forward exercise. And this is actually what I was doing this morning is I want you to think of what you wanna focus on in 2023. And this is a prioritizing exercise. So what you wanna do is identify two or three areas that are currently competing for your interest. So say it's something like employee retention or boosting online sales or creating strategic partnerships, whatever those three things are that for 2023, you're really thinking about. And then I want you to take each one of them and plot them forward individually. Where does each one of them land you after one week? after a month, after six months, do exactly what Allison did. She was so specific. She gave these great examples. Keep pushing yourself to be as specific as possible. And what often happens, really one of two things happens with this exercise. One, you may just realize there's just one thing you wanna focus on. So that's fantastic if that happens. The other thing that happens is that you get all two or all three of them plotted forward and they're in tension with one another but you start to see how they naturally prioritize one another. So it could be that you wanna boost online sales and it could be that in six months, when you plot that forward, you've achieved a certain level that suddenly makes a strategic partnership happen organically. So suddenly you start to see that these are things that can all happen together and you don't have to feel overwhelmed. So the goal of this exercise is to help you organically prioritize this coming year in a way that makes you feel confident and optimistic that all the futures you're dreaming of actually can happen in a way that doesn't just blanket you with a sense of overwhelm. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. So what next? I want you to repeat these exercises as often as possible when you're feeling stuck, when you're feeling frustrated, when you're feeling hopeless or just out of sorts. Remember, there's not a problem with you. It's often a symptom of deep brain restlessness. So if there's one thing you take away from this webinar, I hope it is that I want you to let your deep brain out for a run. The more you practice story thinking, the more creative, optimistic, resilient, and energetic and innovative you're going to be. And I have included here, I know Molly wants to pop, probably pop back on, that if any of you are interested in further trainings, get in touch and we can talk. <laughs> but I know we are hitting time, right, Mal? We are. We are because we want to answer okay. as many questions as we can. And I think, you know, to start, you mentioned something really beautiful earlier um, about, you know, children and that curiosity, but also that confidence plateau mm -hmm. or when everything starts to take a dip. And I think we can all really relate to that on such a personal level about when our own confidence dips. And so I guess, what are your recommendations for everybody tuning in to sort of quell that self-doubt when about their own creativity, especially when maybe you've made a decision in your business that has been a particular failure or been something that really has just dinged that confidence. Yeah. On. You're like, I don't you're even know. Feeling that. Yeah, Nobody you're feeling that ideas. awful feeling. Yeah. I guess the first thing to do is try, and you've heard this a million times, try to have some grace with yourself because creativity, there's no space for judgment in creativity. So try as much as possible. There's, that failure happened and it's a good thing. 
And then try what we do in exercise, we do this with the kids. It's called going backwards to go forwards. So what we ask you to do is think about what was your reason for doing the thing that failed? Because chances are you didn't have to do it the way you did. But that reason, that motivation is still probably a good one and probably still meaningful to you. So do some of these story thinking exercises. And I can give an example, I'm not sure if we have time, to plot it forward so that you can get that same outcome in a different way. And that's something we really practice with the kids. And I'll quickly give you an anecdote. We had a child came into our creativity camp, was in the worst mood. She did not want to be there. She wanted to go to um, space camp. And, and her parents warned us. They're like, she's in a she does not want to be here. And she was a struggle. And she was saying, I don't, you know, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do these extras. I'm not interested. And we finally got her to talk about why she wanted to go to space camp. She wanted to go to space camp because she wanted to float. So we had her go backwards. Are there other, who else floats? Do you have to be an astronaut? And she's like, well, I mean, scuba divers float. Okay, well, wait, how do you become a scuba diver? And she was like, forget space camp. I have to learn how to swim. I mean, and she just was thrilled. And it's the exact same exercise with adults. Figure out that why, what is it you really want? How else can you get there? You can plot multiple futures and multiple ways to get there. So just do the exercise and be nice to yourself. Don't yes. be ashamed. Yes. Well, I, I think what you, what you just ended on maybe lends itself to this next question too. Mm -hmm. So, um, somebody wrote in before the webinar that I get really excited about new ideas for my business, but my energy and my excitement and all of my creativity brings me down rabbit holes. Yes. How do I stay focused? Yeah. Again, it's that plotting one thing forward. And I, I hope so many of you can relate to this question because this is a problem I have. And one of my associates who works with me, she's always like, we need to do one thing, one thing. Um, overwhelm, we are, live in a world that is designed to make us feel overwhelmed, right? I mean, it's right here. Um, we need to be able to trust ourselves that we are instinctually drawn to things that matter to us. So if you can plot just one of those things forward and then set it aside, forget about it, and then plot another thing forward, yeah. it becomes obvious really quickly what actually is meaningful to you. And then make that your priority, Amazing. bar none. Yeah. Okay, so this, this next question comes from Sally and it's such a thoughtful one because a, a lot of folks here um, run businesses that are already requiring deep brain, artistic creativity yeah. on demand, right? Yes. Like taking your passion, you've turned it into a business. And now what is the release exercise look like when you're in the creative space all day? And how do you separate your release from like method recharging? How do you? Yeah. I mean, that is, that is a challenge. And I know, you know, my history is not that important right now, but uh, what I'm doing right now, this work is related to what I studied in graduate school. And when I was in graduate school and had to do it on command, I felt, it's not that I fell out of love with it, but I was depressed. I just couldn't keep that love fresh. So it's taken me until I'm 43 to figure out how to integrate it into my life. So it is a struggle and I get it. Um, and I think, again, the plotting forward exercise, but do it with things that recharge you. So make them a part of your daily practice, right? So that you're actually building in time for things that actually bring you joy. I mean, I, I've talked to so many people in creative businesses and you say to them, well, when's the last time you went and looked at some art? When's the last time you went to a movie? And they're like, oh, I don't. I don't. And you cannot be creative unless you are actually making time to bring those things into your world and to see other perspectives. So anything you can do to see other perspective. And I think my number one recommendation read a biography. If you read a biography of someone who is totally different than you, and I'm someone who likes fiction, so it's, sometimes it's hard for me to pick up a biography, find a biography, read something that is not what you normally read, because your brain will be forced to shift into that perspective, and that will help you return refreshed. You got to get out of your mind. Interesting. That's great advice. Um, I see the chat blowing up, like <laughs> everyone loving that. Um, you guys are great. I think you know, my other question in, in your experience, especially for folks who are managing teams, have mm -hmm. other people's creativity coming to the table. Yes. How can everyone remain open to others' creative ideas? Yeah. Um, especially when I know we all have this inclination, like I tried something similar, that's never going to work. Yes. We're so fast just to negate it. it. Yes. Yeah. Shut it down. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
that's a good question. I think, first of all, you just have to make it a rule in your team that we don't shut any ideas down. We just don't do it. We practice a yes and mentality. And you've probably all heard this. So instead of yes, but you say yes and tell me more. Because part of what you have to do to create a space where people can effectively story think and effectively create is let them understand that you trust them to do so. So a lot of these things, they do come down to trust. Another thing we really focus on is finding the special strengths in your employees. And this, um, this can be a source of discomfort for employers because you hire somebody based on what you think their skill set is and what you think their goals are. And those things evolve. I mean, remember, we are all allowed to change our whys are allowed to change. So your job, I think, as a um, open creative employer is to check in regularly and say to your team, what's changed? What are you excited by now? What are you looking forward to now? And then pair them up. If you have enough people on your team that you can put them into basically dyads. So this person might be really good at closing deals. This person might be really good at getting people interested in deals. I'm just making this up put them together on a project, put people who don't normally work together, together on a project, share with them what the other person's why is, and put them in charge of protecting that. So they're not in charge of their own why, they're in charge of somebody else's. So they take ownership of protecting this other team member, and then you let whatever comes from that tension of the two of them working together, you let that start to flow, because that's where that creative impulse is. It's from the tension of the two people and see what happens. And it takes that onus off of you, right? You don't have to um, choose whether something's a good idea or not. They're gonna work it out together. Yeah, oh, I like that a lot. And I guess in the leadership realm, yeah. um, when, when bringing maybe for some folks, the idea of creativity and this story thinking to their, their own businesses and their teammates, are, have there been things that you have found valuable when kind of debunking the myth of yes. creativity? Like, yeah. you know, it's not just anyone who is an artist yes. or this and that. Like, how do you get it's everybody so hard? I mean, we it took us being in business for about eight months for people to realize, like, we weren't teaching you how to paint. I mean, it's really confusing. We think we know what creativity is. I would say don't even use the word. Just take them through the exercises. And then as they get better at it, just say what we've been developing is your creativity. But that's why in a lot of ways, we really push on the story thinking method because it, it takes the pressure off of you to create something because you're, everyone can think in story. You know, you don't have to turn out the Mona Lisa. You just have to follow a story through and get to know people as characters. And I will say like, again, like in terms of shutting down all that judgment, the more you practice these exercises, the more naturally empathetic you get because this part of your brain responds to empathy and it builds empathy. And so if you continue to practice them, you'll notice that suddenly you're way more open. It just happens. It's, a, it's, an, it's an effect of doing the work. So. Absolutely. Um, well, I, let me see if I can get one more question in. Okay, so for, for things, and I know everyone has a different definition of boring. Some people out yes. there love the math. Some people out there don't love the math. Uh, when it's the task that you personally find mm -hmm. most dull. Or okay. Boring, how can we anchor back into the creativity? Because there's got to be a way to apply it. Totally. First of all, how would CC do it? Right. <laughs> approach it. I mean, I know that sounds so simplistic, but approach it like somebody else would. Again, that takes the pressure off of you. Um, second, think a little bit about maybe yourself as a character or run one of these exercises with somebody who is using you. So I can give an example of a group that I worked with and we found out this leader, this was a, um, a marketing group for a fashion corporation and the leader loved gossip. I mean, one of the things we really found out about her, not like malicious gossip, but like she loves to tell a funny story yeah. and she dreaded the weekly meeting that she had to leave. Like she dreaded it because it was so dry and it was so dull and no one looked forward to it, it was Monday morning. And we said to her, well, why aren't you sharing who you are in the way you run this task? Why aren't you starting it with like, guys, I heard this really good story. Now, not again, not malicious gossip, but start it with a little fun story so that people can then relate to you that you are someone who enjoys those stories. Make it about yourself in a productive, generative way. Um, again, is that gonna make you love balancing your books? Probably not, but I bet like CC would do that and then, you know, do something wonderful after. So you just want to channel all those other people or figure out who has skills in that area 
and reassign the task. Mm -hmm. Get rid of it. Just yeah. give it, someone else loves it. It's just not you. Absolutely. Yeah. It reminds me that a trend we notice with our webinar attendees is, you know, and no blame to the community, but you show <laughs> up for the, for maybe the topics you're most safe mm -hmm. doing or that excite you most. Yeah. But this year, maybe challenge yourself. If you don't yes. want to, if you're afraid of that financial webinar or that's the boring one, that's the one you should attend. Absolutely. That's the same thing as like reading that biography. Yeah. Do the thing that is different from what you normally do. Nothing bad's going to happen to you. It's just going to help you grow. And yeah. also you might see people on that financial webinar who are so jazzed about finances that then you can tap into them. They can be someone you write a biography about. And like, then you can start to feel that joy. It's just about opening yourself up being brave. It's about not being afraid. And I know everybody has that in them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, one, one very task oriented question that came in from Nancy around these exercises is um, if we don't formally do the exercises with our team, say there's, you know, not, not really the, the space for that. Yeah, or the sure. time, how could we use the questions or encourage the same results just through conversation? Is that possible. So it's not as effective if it's just verbal. I will say this, we do find that if you write down these answers, the effect is much more profound. Um, what we've done with groups, particularly groups and companies that are working remotely, is I just tell them, find one meeting a week that you can cancel because pretty much everybody can cancel one meeting a week and spend 30 minutes doing these exercises. And if it has to be verbal, do it verbally or write it down and then read it and do it with someone. It doesn't have to be that whole team. Do it with someone from your team or just do it alone. Because again, it's not about telling somebody else. It's about going through the process of thinking through the story internally. Um, and it should be fun. I mean, you can, I think we could see Allison was excited talking about CC. This should be fun to do. Um, I think that's, that's it. It doesn't help if you don't do it. I, I hate saying that, but if you don't do it, it doesn't help. Reading about it doesn't, doesn't help. You got to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. You. Um, this was such a beautiful way to start 2023 with this community. Um, Allison, thank you for your yes. vulnerability, for sharing your amazing CC story. Shout out to Cece. Yes, forever. Cece forever. forever. <laughs> <laughs>